There we go. This meeting is being recorded, y'all. All right, who else we got? New York, we got DMV. We got Jam, Jam and e calling from Georgia. Trying to re-envision media. I ain't got so much love. We got Debbie in Alabama. I am attracting what I'm All right, y'all, we got about 15 more seconds. If you have not already, let us know who you are and what is bringing you here. We got Osceola in the building. Hello, my love. I like this little picture you got. It's very cute. Who else we got in the building? Jihan calling from Atlanta to absorb and spread love. Welcome. We got Talia Scott, one of my students. Shout out to all of my students in the building. All right, y'all. I'm so excited. We got folks from a little bit of everywhere here in the building. And we are here to talk about Black women and radical media. We have a panel of brilliant, when I say brilliant, brilliant Black women media makers in the building. And I'm just so excited for what this panel is going to do for us intellectually, spiritually. All right in all ways. So I'm going to, um, oh, I'm seeing the chat is buzzing. Okay. What's good. I see y'all calling from the Bay here. Cause I love black women. Yes. Same that part. We love it. I say here for it all. So we are going to go ahead. I'm going to start pinning folks and we're going to dive in. So I just want to start off by giving y'all a little bit of an overview of what is bringing us here. So I am Rila Violet Botswar, founder of Black Women Healing, and I'm also professor at Merritt College. And I'm so excited. Again, shout out to my students who are here in the building, y'all. I have the privilege and the honor of teaching Black women in radical media this semester at Merritt College. And so in this class, we are talking about Black women's relationship to media in a lot of different ways, right? And our class is a three-part course. Uh-oh, I got another student joining in. Let me go ahead and admit Luna. Welcome in. Welcome in. Good to see you, Luna. So this course is really exciting because we're thinking about radical media, right? We're thinking about Black women's media in a radical way. We're thinking about how Black women are allowed to be nuanced in our full whole selves on screen. And that's really the guiding question of this course is when and how do Black women get to be nuanced and multifaceted on screen? So we're really looking at the ways where we haven't been able to be that and what that progress towards that has been. So part one of our course, which we are wrapping up this week, is about Black women's relationship to mass media and our relationship to social media, right? To the media that we see on our phone, particularly thinking about Instagram. So we have with us today, y'all, we have some brilliant panelists who are going to be diving into this conversation with us. We are going to start off um, with just the intro. I'm going to give y'all the bios. When I say these bios is popping, I don't know if y'all ready for these bios, but we're going to get into them. All right, then I'm going to start the q and I have some questions that I want to know from them. Then we're going to go into audience Q&A. So then y'all will have an opportunity to ask of the panelists what y'all want to know, what y'all want to dive into. All right. So I'm seeing folks in the chat saying y'all ready. So if y'all say y'all ready, we want to dive into these bios. All right. So we're going to start with my sis, Erin Nay. Also, let me just say, y'all, not only are these brilliant Black women media makers, but they also are my loved ones, my sisters, my homegirls, and my friends. I'm so honored to know and love them. So we're going to get started with Erin Nay, who is at Erin B. Creating 
on Instagram. Go ahead and drop your IG in the chat, sis. Erin is a multidisciplinary artist and a PhD student whose work strives to animate the lives of Black girls and women. Her platform, Erin B. Creating on Instagram, narrates her life in the Black feminist tradition. Mm. It is eclectic while feeling whole. Y'all see we talking about nuance, right? Come on, wholeness. In an effort to encourage others to do the same, she recently launched the Black Girls Ben Theory, which I stand, campaign to honor the work Black girls and women do every day to exist in the world. Welcome in, Erin Renee. We are so, so glad to have you here. And I love Black Girls Ben Theory. I'm passionate about it because it just talks about what it means to be an everyday, round the way, disrespectable, right? My students know we've got to get into disrespectability for our next panel. But I love how Black Girls Ben Theory is talking about all the ways that Black girls and Black women just be who we are unapologetically. And that in and of itself is brilliant and is theory. So thank you, Erin Nay, for being here and welcome. Next, we have Brooklyn Baker who is an honors graduate of the illustrious Hampton University. Shout out to my students who want to go to HBCUs. Y'all might want to write a little bit in the chat to Brooke and get some HBCU love there. All right, where she received a bachelor's degree in journalism with a minor in theater. She was an initiate of Gamma Iota Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Hey, Soror. And her most esteemed collegiate accomplishment was serving as the 60th Miss Hampton University. In August of 2016, Brooklyn founded the Good Girl Movement, which I also stand. Go ahead and drop some info in the chat about the Good Girl Movement so we can tap in, which started out as a blog and turned into a nation wide service organization with nearly 10 chapters at a host of various universities, as well as a profitable business. Her newfound passion is film. She directed music videos for various upcoming artists. Soon after, God aligned her path with the Nate Parker Foundation where she co-wrote a short film and will go on to premiere at the 2019 Pan-African Film Festival, y'all. I told y'all y'all wasn't ready for these bios. She went on to write and produce a docu-series with Nate Parker and the foundation, interviewing the likes of Brian Stevenson, founder of EJI, and freedom fighter Zayanna Bryant. Currently, she is the showrunner's assistant on Issa Rae's new HBO show, Rap Shit. I told y'all y'all wasn't ready for the bios. She finds strength in her favorite quote, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope I wouldn't have a single bit of talent left and could say I use everything you gave me. And I love that quote from Braxton Blueby Baker, who is also on our syllabus, Brooklyn's beloved sister, who is now our ancestor, who we are going to be studying in the next part of our class, thinking about what it means to produce radical media as queer Black women. So shout out to Brax, shout out to Brooke, and Brooke, thank you so much again for being here. Next up, y'all, we have Lizette London. Uh-oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to um, mention Brooke. Please drop your IG in the chat so folks can tap in with you as well. That IG is at Brooklyn, by Brooklyn, at by Brooklyn, all right? Next up, we got Lizette London, who is at Lizette period London on IG. Make sure y'all tap in. And for my students, all of these Instagram accounts are also on our syllabus. All right. So Lizette London is a proud New York native, NYC in the building, and Black feminist scholar, artivist filmmaker and writer. In 2017, she earned her BA in Comparative Women's Studies from Spelman College. Shout out to all my Spelman sisters in the building, where she co-produced her first documentary short chronicling a community's response to gentrification in the historic West Side District of Atlanta, Georgia. 
Her student film entitled Rooted became an official student selection of the 2017 Bronze Lens Film Festival. I told y'all, y'all was not ready for the ways that these women is slaying. Lizette continued her research in Black feminist critical media studies if that don't say everything we're doing in this class, right? I don't know what to, right? She heard continue her research in Black feminist critical media studies at New York University's Gallatin School of Individualized Study, earning her master's in May of 2020. Aside from her studies, Lizette worked as a graduate film teaching assistant at NYU. Uh oh, we got some other folks joining us. Welcome in, welcome in. All right, under the tutelage of filmmaker Spike Lee. Told y'all y'all weren't ready. And renowned black photography historian and scholar, Deborah Willis. In 2020, she began her passion project, the Lavandula Project, which I also stand, which is also on that syllabus, right? an artist garden and community collective based in Brooklyn, New York, where she centers and grounds the village in the historic and contemporary artistic and intellectual traditions of Black women filmmakers, photographers, and creative writers. Most recently, Lizette finished her first major production with Spike Lee as a researcher and director's assistant on the HBO documentary Epicenters. She will be starting on her next feature project as an associate producer in the coming weeks. So if y'all are not tapped in, Lizette, go ahead and write everything in the chat that folks need to know to tap in with you, LizetteLondon.com, TheLavandulaProject.com, and at Lizette.London on Instagram. Whew, I told y'all, these sisters is fire. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in. I read these bios. I gave y'all a little bit of a sense, right, just from the bios of who these brilliant Black women film and media makers are. But I want to go ahead and give an opportunity to just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, your name, your hometown, the work you do, and how did you end up doing this work? What was your personal journey into using media as a tool for self-expression and liberation? So we can go ahead and start with Lizette, and then we can go to Brooke, and then we'll go to Erin May. Let's dive right in. Hey family, what's up beautiful people? Um, so yes, as we stated, my name is Liz, she, her, hers. I am a proud Brooklyn native, afro Pinai black feminist. Um, my work started um, back in college. Well, I picked up a camera in high school. Um, when I got to college, I also had my camera, but during that time, we also had the death of Michael Brown. Um, and I started to kind of question a lot of things. I had a lot of inquiries and I was like, I wanna see new stories. I wanna feel new stories. I want to create new stories. I wanna create new worlds. Um, so my love for the camera and visual storytelling then transferred into like my love for writing. Um, and I was like, if a white man can write this, I can write this too. But also I learned, you know, being a woman studies major, I saw in college that black women been doing this. Like Erin said, black women been theory. And so I was like, wow, look at all these renowned black women filmmakers, writers, artists, scholars, and black historians who have been talking about how black women have been using media, creating media for centuries. Um, but we don't get the same shine. And so once I started to dive into my history and my legacy, I was like, there's nothing I can't do. And I was like, if I don't have the platform right now, I'm gonna build a platform and I'm gonna find those who are aligned with my, you know, aligned with my visions, my dreams, um, create community and then from there branch out. Um, I think the biggest part of my work when it comes to black feminist visual arts and cultural studies is basically saying like, um, pick up a camera, pick up a pen, but also dive into black feminist theory. Learn about what black women scholars are saying about the type of media that we're creating. Learn about how black women are theorizing about what it means to sit as a black woman and basically put your life on paper, create black um, female protagonists. Like, what does it mean? What does this process mean um, in its entirety? Um, what type of things does it evoke? You know, the type of features that we're telling. There are so many 
Black women and scholars that are talking about the way that we create spaces and create stories and create worlds. And so in your journey of becoming a media maker, a visual storyteller, a writer, um, add some theory into that because I feel like from there you can't be stopped. Um, the industry loves to kind of like water down our process, but it's literally in our process where we find the biggest and deepest gems, um, even in the books that we don't you know, usually see on the bookshelves. But for example, this is one of my favorite books, Black Women Writers. So this is just another tool that I combine in my journey for um, visual storytelling. So that's my journey. I'm sticking to it. Um, and yeah, and clearly I love black women. I studied black women in college, even though I went to Spelman to become a physical therapist. But this upper class um, person who was like, Liz, you should um, become a comparative women's studies major. I was like, what am I gonna do with that? Y'all, she, she changed my whole life. Study black women in college, study black women in grad school, and I'm still studying black women. I'm gonna study black women for the rest of my life. So thank you, Reed, for opening up this space, period. <laughs> Okay, period. We love it. Thank you so much, Liz. And y'all know I'm extra. I got to give my little anecdote, right? So I met Liz in the writing center at Spelman College. I was a senior and Liz was a freshman and I was working in the writing center and Liz came in like, I'm just so stressed. I cannot write this paper. And she was literally writing about um, police brutality, right? That was in 2015, um, 2014. And I have just loved and appreciated Liz so much. And thank you because I also want to say, y'all, Liz really helped with this syllabus. I had to call Liz and I had to call Brooklyn and I was like, look, y'all, I need some advice. Help me curate this syllabus. And so shout out to all of the brilliant studies that Lizette has engaged, which has allowed me to teach this class um, more effectively. So I love and appreciate you, Liz. Thank you. Next up, we are are going to go to Brooke. Hey y'all, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Brooklyn Baker. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I just want to shout out Liz because I love her. She's my self-proclaimed mentor. She doesn't even know, but like I'm <laughs> obsessed with her, especially when it comes to this film. Um, I'll be cussing. So when it comes to this film world, um, Liz really be holding me down because I went to Google University when it comes to this film shit, you know, like I was on YouTube, I was on Google, like nobody taught me anything, you know, I had to go out there and seek that knowledge for myself. And so Liz um, was really an amazing person. So it's also utilizing social media, which we'll get to, to really like reach out to these amazing black women and be like, you about this black woman empowerment, so empower me because I need some guidance. So, um, but when it comes to my own personal journey, um, I went to Hampton University and I, I fell in love with film through a film festival that we had. I just went because I was just like, I need a credit. And Robbie Reed was there and Ruth Carter. I'm like, oh, you brought up the heavy hitters. And so that's when I really fell in love. And then from there, um, what I would say is I found the Nate Parker Foundation through my friend Maya who surprised me being here. Hey, Maya. And so that's when I was like, really fell in love with the art of film. So with, within film, I really am able to find the balance between selfishness and selflessness within releasing my art as in this art is for me. You know what I'm saying? Also with us exploring um, black women media and radical and all of the theory, also you can be carrying the weight of your race and your gender on your shoulders. And sometimes that's not always your responsibility, but it's also finding the balance of the responsibility of you can change the world. Because if Issa Rae wouldn't have put out Insecure, I wouldn't be here. So I do want someone else's Black woman journey to be tied to mine, but also realizing that your art is for you as well. You know, and God gave you something to be able to produce in this world for whatever reason that may be, you know? So I'm really mastering the art of the gray, not just in film, but in life. And so that's really my journey. We love it. Thank you so much, Brooke. Brooke is, um my little sister and i'm just so proud of the healing and the growth okay and we love i love how you said not just in film but in life and so how our praxis which my students we gonna get into this right praxis which means theory and practice we're merging the intellectual ideas with what we really do in our real lives so the way that we approach our production and curation of radical media is also 
also helps us to figure out how do we want to approach our everyday? How do we want to approach our lives? So thank you so much, Brooke. Next up, we have my sis, Erin Nay. I just want to say I am so, so proud to know you, sis. Erin Nay slays on the gram. And so when we when I was curating my syllabus, I was like, Erin Nay is going to be on the syllabus for social media because, and I did, I'm going to send you, sis. I'm going to send you that part of my lecture. I had you on my slides. I said, y'all see how she slays on the gram and gives us new ways to be unapologetically and fully multifaceted as Black women, right? And so I love your social media praxis and how that informs, from what I experienced, how that informs the way you move through the world as the brilliant Black woman you are. So thank you again. And, and you're not only a social media artist, right, but you also are a photographer and so many other things with the brilliant media that you produce. So thank you again for being here. And we're going to come to you next I always love when you do an introduction for us because it's so like it's so warm it's like a hug it doesn't matter <laughs> where we are geographically I feel like you're hugging me um so I'm so thankful for this space thank you for inviting all of us here you're such a beautiful space maker I feel like that's one of your many gifts but an incredibly precious one. So um, I'm always glad to share space with y'all. Um, I am Erin A or Erin, whichever is fine. Um, I'm currently on a sabbatical or a leave of absence for my PhD program to pursue uh, my creative talents full time. Um, I started freelancing in July full time. So that's that's been a nice transition, interesting transition, tough transition, if we're being honest but we're here okay we're making it it's one day at a at a time um I love to read about black women um and since I was a little girl I was reading about black women I think trying to find some sense of myself my mother is white um and my dad who was a black man was adopted by a white family so I like was constantly without knowing it searching for these black maternal figures in different types of media um and it just transitioned I think it, throughout my journey of high school and into college and then into grad school I really started studying like black children and and the black children in, in um, literature turned into black women, black women in education. And then I got to my PhD program and I was solely studying like black feminist theory and intersectionality. Um, and I started asking questions about like, well, why are we not, you know, trying to tag on our research into what's happening in current current events in ways that make sense to the people who are being affected by current events, you know, in ways that make sense in ways that are applicable. And that's kind of how Black Girls Been Theory came about, um, because I'm like this everyday stuff we see Cardi B maybe even, you know, uh, making this analysis or this incredibly uh, thoughtful critique, political critique, right? But people are writing her off because she doesn't have an education or she was a stripper or whatever. And so like starting to see some of that commentary for me made me realize um, that there is so much beauty in our everydayness. And even though it's not read as professional or brilliant or uh, correct by whiteness and white standards, doesn't mean it's not brilliant still, period. Not just for black girls or black women, it's already brilliant. Um, and so I'm in my PhD and I'm like, I don't want to write about this because nobody reads these research papers. Nobody who looks like me reads these research papers at all. Um, and so if I want them to read it, then I have to take what I already wrote in a really long research paper and put it into an infographic that they can just scam in two seconds. And I'm like, that doesn't really make sense to me when I know my friends will get on YouTube and watch a five minute video. So how can I put together what I've learned in my in, with my research, you know, as as Lizette has done with her work and put it into the world. And then I have what Brooklyn has done where it's like self taught. I didn't go to school for film or how to create videos or how to take photographs. But I'm like, I'm really passionate about this. So let me go to Google University and find a way to like merge the two together in a way that makes sense. So right now, um, I've been doing some of that I just 
just finished my first music video, which I feel like is kind of your first step into the that role. You know, I directed it and I edited it, edited it, all the D's. <laughs> I'll drop a link in, in the chat when I'm finished. And um, the first film that I assistant directed for over the summer just got um, pitched to Big Sean and, and is possibly going to Sundance. So I'm excited about that. Um, so yeah, there's some beautiful things, you know, cooking over here. And I have some things I'm trying to get off here in the city of Detroit. That's where I'm located. Um, I'm from North Carolina, but I'm in the D. And yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. I hope I didn't talk too long. Shout out to Detroit. Uh-uh, not at all. Thank you so much. Wow, y'all. I told y'all that they are... This panel is so dope on so many levels. And I think that's what else I want my students to really understand is that we as Black women who are media makers, who are doing such amazing dope work, it's not just about what we produce in the world, but about who we also are, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's just such a beautiful part of doing this type of work in sisterhood and in community um, is that we just get to see our full, our nuance. And so what my hope is, is that this, this, meeting and this recording this collective communal gathering is also producing media on screen that invites black women to see ourselves reflected in nuanced and multifaceted ways so when we talk about praxis this right here right now what we are doing on screen is a part of that praxis so thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for those rich and warm and beautiful introductions. Now I want to go into a question because y'all know I'm passionate about Black women's relationship to our Black girlhood. So I got a question for y'all. Who was your favorite Black woman or Black girl in the media when you were a Black girl? Who was your fave and why? And who is your fave now? It might be the same person or it might not. Uh, but why do you love them? What makes you so passionate about them? And then the next part of the question is, there's been so much talk about uh, representation, representation matters, and then the critique of representation matters, because we know that representation is not all we need to get us free, right? So I also just want y'all to reflect on like, who was your faves and why? And like, does representation matter? And if so, what are its limitations? Like, why is it so important for us to be represented? And what are the limitations of those representation um, as we think about what it means to get us free? So whoever wants to dive in, we will just open up the forum. Oh, I forgot I wanted to tell y'all my fave. So my fave was Penny Proud. Brit Brit, my inner child said, I need y'all to know, because I love the, the episode where she was saying, I'm Penny Proud, I'm cute and I'm loud and I got it going on. I wanted to be Penny Proud so bad. And I was so happy when Proud Family came out as a 10 year old black girl. So Penny has a very special place in my heart, but I'm gonna uh, go ahead and open up the floor, whoever wanna dive in. <laughs> I can go first. Um, for me, my last name is Elliot. So I love Missy Elliot. Like you could not tell me I was not Missy Elliot. It was the first album that I bought with my real money at um, my allowance. Um, it was her second album under construction. And I just wanted to be her so bad. I felt like um, where I lived at the time, my parents were military, so I moved around a lot when I was younger, but where I live was like a rural area of Kansas. And so it was very white. And I just felt like Missy Elliott for me <laughs> was talking back about what it meant to be a black girl, a black woman to talk her shit to men and then just to the world in a way that I understood it in a way that like wasn't too aggressive that like a nine-year-old couldn't listen to it but also was a little too saucy for a nine-year-old to be listening to but I feel like she really gave me everything that I needed like she was just she was popping her shit and I wanted to be her really bad and sometimes when I go to Starbucks I will still tell them that my name is Missy you know I'll be like it's Missy <laughs> <laughs> um and then as far as that other part of your question I feel like representation does 
matter in the sense that um, if if we don't see things in places, people in places, we don't think it's possible for it to happen for us. However, representation can be so, it becomes um, an oversaturated word in itself and then the meaning becomes diluted. So it doesn't look like one representation of for the entire race or the entire gender, right? All of our storylines is not Joan from Girlfriends or, uh, <laughs> or um, you know, uh, I uh, can't even remember, Rashida from Love and Hip Hop, right? That's not all of our storylines, but they are representative of some people's story, of some people's experience. And so continuing to like diversify what that is in the media is really important. That's why I love Issa Rae's work. Um, that's why I love even sometimes Lena Waite's work, you know, can be a little overrepresentational sometimes. <laughs> it can be overrepresentational sometimes, but I think it's important to have those people in those places because then they can create opportunities for other folks to come in and tell stories or to continue to nuance that. So, um, yeah. Um, so the, the person that stuck out for me when it comes to my inner child, this person that screamed to me was Reagan Simone from That's So Raven. And what's crazy is like, one thing I'm trying to do is just let my spirit speak to me and not try to be too logistical and super analyzed. So I'm not really able to pinpoint right now in the most analytical way as to why, but my spirit spoke Reagan Simone. And I think really truly because she walked in her fullness and she knew who she was you know what i'm saying and as a child i knew who i was and i'm trying to rediscover that beautiful girl so when it comes to who i currently love uh isa i love isa so much i also love ava duvernay mari rock Akil, debbie allen lena waif you know because of her nuances and braxton like um my sister that we were talking about she felt so represented by 20s and so that's what ties into representation so to be able to see her reaction when she saw herself for the first time on television, I will never forget that feeling. And to be able to provide that for other people, you know, like some people don't even realize how, how much they're craving to really see themselves until they're able to have that opportunity. You know what I'm saying? And so that is something that whenever, um, that I will always be like, this is why I wanted to do this, or this is why God ordained this, you know? And when it just comes to what film was able to do, just provide and promote goodness, humanization, just all of the things, I'm just like, wow, you're able to do it in just such a dope way. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's, that's what happened. I love that. I just need to hop in. Thank you so much, Brooke, because we have 20s on our syllabus as well. My students watch 20s. Um, our first week. And so I just want to shout out because we we hella enjoyed that. And thank you, Brooke, for um, helping me to add that to the syllabus. I hella appreciate you. Yes. And so for me also, it was Raven Simone. But in addition to Raven Simone, well, so Raven Simone because she could tell the future and she was thick. And growing up, I'm also I'm half Filipino, but and I'm half black. And so um I ate a lot and I love food. But like it was just nice to see her doing her thing, dancing, laughing, just you know, just being like Brooke said, full in her personality and herself. And so um, growing up, I definitely wanted to be an extension of Raven Simone, maybe her right hand, I'm not sure. But um, also, I love um, Tia and Tamara from Sister Sister. I didn't have a twin, but they really made me wanted to have a twin because I also kind of grew up as the only child. I have siblings, but in the house, I just be like, Liz, you heard that? No, girl, but listen, we're going to just keep doing and I'll focus on <laughs> whatever going on. <laughs> but but sister and, what Sister and Sister taught me was... Um, to be adventurous. And so I got to watch them from, you know, from when they were younger to growing up and going to college and going to, you know, having all these experiences. And I was like, oh my God, is that what, you know, teenagehood is gonna look like, adulthood, college, you know? But then when I got to college and I started getting into myself and getting all poetic and things like that, I'm not even a poet, but I was like, ooh, Denise Huxtable. I really relate with Denise Huxtable. Like, yes, I'm gonna go have tea at the Women's Studies lunch later today. I'll see you later. <laughs> she was just very like, I don't know. She's very sensual in my opinion. So Denise Huxtable. Um, and right now I do love me some Issa. I love me some Ava. I love me some 
there's so many folks. For some reason, I can't think right now. But also shout out to Nia DaCosta for um, Candyman. Um, I heard she re hit record numbers at the box office. And that's so important, especially because she was working under Jordan Peele, uh, Shay Ancestor, Rain That Blessing on Me. I would love to work for Monkey Paw Productions. Um, but yeah, so um, in terms of representation, of course it's important. Like it's so important also because in the simple fact that like before, I feel like even when we aren't kind of like lucid or hip to it we're always imagining things and when we imagine things I feel like images come up visual images come up in our brain of what could be or what can happen and things like that and so I feel like sometimes representations can be a way of, of affirming that that dream can happen um it's all about you know in terms of what you see and how you see in the world um looking is such an incredible like um medium for conjuring different um things but also like enlivening your imagination. So representations are very important, but however, the machine of Hollywood, the algorithms of Instagram, all of, the, all of those different things, even when it comes to, um, uh, a girl, okay, Real Housewives, what's that franchise called again? What, what type of media is it? reality what, shows. yes thank you sorry i draw blanks i'm truly an auntie y'all i may be 26 but literally my soul is from like centuries ago um so <laughs> reality shows sometimes um conflates representation for just harmful images and, and reiterates negative stereotypes that sometimes can make just completely turn the, the meaning of representation on its ass and that's the only thing that i'm grappling with um, and so, yeah, I would love to get into that too, but yes, representation is very important, um, but there are also big agendas at work in terms of what that means, how it looks like, and who has power over which representation can get back by billions of dollars, um, and which representations can just stay maybe at, you know, in the indie fest or something like that, so yeah. Thank y'all so, so much. Mm, all of that. Yes, yes, yes. I just want to add a few things I was thinking about. So when we talked about being nuanced and multifaceted on screen in our class, we've been thinking about that through the lens of like being my full whole self unapologetically. And we talked about stereotypes and how it's nothing wrong with me like a fried chicken and watermelon. It's nothing wrong with me being loud and ratchet and ghetto. It's something wrong if that's the only thing I get to be. Because I can be many things at once. And the moment when I only see one small piece of who I am and not all of who I am, that's when media becomes really harmful and dangerous. So I talked to my students about Moesha because as I'm doing my inner child healing, we have been loving Moesha, really my teenage, Reese. Reese from middle school is just here for Moesha. And in my imagination, me and Moesha be shopping at Shellingham Mall together and hanging out. So I love Moesha and I love how she was this like really, like a really powerful black girl but in a lot of ways she was a strong black woman as a black girl she took on a lot of hyper responsibility for the black men and black boys in her life and i remember sorry y'all this is a spoiler alert go ahead and just mute me now if you ain't seen the episode about mother's day from moesha i'm gonna give y'all a spoiler but that episode when it's mother's day and she goes to her mom's grave and I just, Reese and me felt offended because she didn't get to cry. Like she was so sad and she was so upset about not having her mom. It was her first Mother's Day without her mom, but we didn't get to see her cry. And the fact that she had to be this strong black girl and she was adultified in a lot of ways because she was this strong black woman and we don't get to see her emote. We don't get to see her uh, torn up emotionally about 
about losing her mom. And it just was a reminder that in the nineties, you know what I'm saying? Like we, we didn't, we weren't necessarily afforded the image of a black girl who was brilliant and smart and had it going on and was also sad sometimes. And so I just wanted to name that like, when we talk about nuance, it's that we get to be in all of our fullness. We get to be sad, mad, happy, angry, ratchet, hypersexual, hyper intellectual, right? We get to be all of it because that's really what our lives do look and feel like, particularly when we're able to lean into our own wholeness in real life. So thank y'all again for all of that brilliance. My next question is really about the title of my class, Black Women in Radical Media. And I want to know what does Black Women in Radical Media mean to you in your own work? And how does it impact your approach to the media that you create and curate? And again, the floor is open, whoever want to dive in. Y'all rather me call on y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say for myself, um, Black Women in Radical Media, I have, I have like wrote some things down. So I was like, Liz, you need to write some things down because sometimes you just start talking and you don't stop. And I also want to stay on task. <laughs> um, and so I wrote Black Women in Radical Media to me highlights agency, self-proclamation, self-creation. And like you said, Rhea, it highlights nuance um, because that radical media, I feel like gives, it's a way for us to kind of affirm and acknowledge that we have agency to create images and narratives, especially visual narratives for ourselves. But, you know, add a bit of intention into that about how we want to feel from what we create, how we want to relate to our art. Um, and so I feel like from my approach, some things that I was thinking about was thinking about the landscape as the landscape of media as an extension of lineage. Um, literally, again, just talking about how Black women have been doing this since I came along, and literally this work is a part of the work that they've been doing, um, and that it's important for me to acknowledge that, to remember that whatever I want to create, I can do it, um, and to know that there is that space out there to do it, and so also um, another part of, I would say, the process, for me, the process is kind of learning how to read images. Um, Images don't stand alone. Images have a lot of information in them um, and images can be read like books. And um, when I think of radical media, I think about adding onto that process of being a, an artist or a creator, um, knowing myself as a spectator and as a consumer and also kind of digging deeper into the works where women are creating images, but also supplementing, supplementing those images with words and writing. And so what are these women saying about their writings and how are they kind of describing what's actually going on? Um, because of course I can pull from the image the way I want to, but also these women are like, just so you don't get anything confused, here's what I was trying to do in this piece of work or in this art, or here's my Instagram caption to let you know how I was feeling in this image. Um, but also maybe I don't know what I was feeling in this image. So here's an Instagram caption to kind of add into, you know, what I've been thinking about, a daily reflection um, to me. So that's part of um, radical art and kind of radicalizing the process or the, the relationship of being a spectator to images. Um, and then the third is kind of rooting my own creative process in Black feminist praxis. So asking questions of story, critiquing story, um, and kind of theorizing or, yeah, theorizing kind of like inner and outer worlds. So. For example, maybe journaling in my practice, what's happening in this moment that I'm writing about this scene or what's happening in this moment where I'm having to push my character to kind of engage in conflict in a way that she might not want to engage, but it's necessary because it's for her growth. It's for her, you know, her, her character story and development because in, in, in the, especially in my field of like film and writing, it's like you get to see nuance on the screen in a different way. And so what are the ways that we're pushing nuance to kind of explore different avenues of conflict or interaction or engagement, you know, just kind of opening up the spectrum for representation also. Like black women do other things in their daily life. Black women do other things, you know, when they wake up in the morning, black women do other things when they have time for themselves to go out, you know, wherever. So radical media kind of encompasses all of that. Um, what it means to be a writer on the inside, what it means to kind of question your own story, what it means to engage with other stories in a different way and ask questions. Um, 
and just yeah recognizing your agency to do so but also proclaiming your space to say this is how i'm taking this is how i'm wanting to take up space um and this is how i want to grow space and curate space um and make this space a home for me and for other black women and girls um or members of the village and community so yeah Um, one point that I uh, learned, I took, I had the pleasure of taking one of Ree's courses, I think it was like last year or something recent. And one of the points that she brought up was that it just made me just feel so blessed to be a creative in the time that I am in like 2021, because our ancestors were creatives and some of them had to ascend with the creativity and the vision still within them. So when I am channeling my creativity, I know it's my ancestors birthing their visions also through mine and I think it's so powerful you know within that so when I think of radical media I think that it's not just me it's not just my vision it's also my ancestors and I also just think that they're like girl birth it all birth it all so all of those nuances are just like all about the spectrum of black women and just like how vast that is you know what I'm saying and also another point was like when it the way that I approach it is just um, using it as an escapism, you know, like the education is gonna be there, but I want, it to, I want you to feel the depth, but not the heaviness. I still want my art to still feel like an escape from the world because life is already so heavy, you know? So I want you to laugh and it's like, oh damn, that was kind of deep on the low. Like, you know, my, my humor is a little dark because dark, um, you know, I am coming in commune with my darkness, but it's also funny. Like life be like really funny, you know? So like, that's why I love animation and I love comedy because I want you to feel all the feels at once and also I just want my approach to be that while you're watching my art you're discovering your own artists within you you know God was the ultimate creator and God created you we're all created whether you call yourself one or not you know so to just be able to discover and see yourself your highest self while you're participating in watching and experiencing the art that my ancestors and God have birthed within me so we're all mothers you feel me birthing That was so beautiful. And I feel like you said, like, Liz, put it in the chat, please. We need we need that on all the affirmation cards immediately. T-shirts, mugs, everything, like the whole merch kit, okay? <laughs> um, for me, I feel like Black women and radical media means it, it, it's about like being willing to push the boundaries consistently um and and whatever that boundary is for you you know um and in a way that feels authentic to who you are and for me as liz was describing as well like it's it's about constantly asking myself how i show up in on the screen and how i'm depicting myself and i've i've realized that most recently with a client as i'm working on her music video that back and forth between like how I would like her to be represented versus how she would like to represent herself and understanding like where, how, how to represent her in a way that's the best light and still maintaining who she is while maintaining true to what my, my personal brand is, right? And constantly pushing the boundary of myself in that place as well as her um is like a live application of of what being a black woman in radical media <laughs> is to me currently because we just finished that video so it is fresh okay very very fresh um <laughs> and i feel like um as I move forward, it's something that I'm gonna continue to be thinking about all of the time in the different spaces that I put out. I think every time I make an Instagram reel, I'm trying to think about, is this re truly reflective of, of who I am in this moment? Like I, if it's a recap video and I was sad, some of that week, I'm gonna make sure there's a clip of me and they're not smiling. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure that there's some sort of representation of the fullness of my energy in that period of time. It doesn't have to be the whole 60 seconds, focus on me being unhappy, but if that happened then I was taking a picture or a video and I was looking kind of down, it's going in there because that's who I am. And I have to push that boundary of what's normal and what's acceptable and what's exciting. And it makes people uncomfortable sometimes, but that's part of who I am. Like the fullness of who, my, who I am is gonna make a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, so that is something that I've been like taking with me and trying to do more consistently. And then yeah, I think I answered I, I answered your last question in both. 
I just wanted to make sure I'm checking my notes. I'm like, did I say everything I wanted to say? <laughs> you, did, you did. You did. Thank y'all so much. I love, I love hearing about how you're nuancing your IG presence, how y'all seeing your creative process as deeply ancestral, even just thinking about Raven as like a black girl who was connected to a diasporic spiritual praxis, right? That she was like seeing the future and, and that being on TV, that was huge huge you know and you know a lot of times we grew up like uh-uh that's that who do voodoo that's that wicked satan and you know but it was just so normalized like yeah i'm a black girl who be seeing the future with spiritual gifts and i'm having fun with my friends at school you know like i just appreciate just the ancestral presence in this conversation feels really sacred so thank y'all for that um my next question is about like how have black women forced contemporary mass media to shift for us and how has that process looked over time so in the conversations that i've had with liz and brooke y'all both shared a lot with me that helped me put my syllabus together around like that historical process of like how did black women get to this point where we're able to have the easter ray like what is that historical process and who are the black women who made that possible um and Aaron, I know with a lot of the media that you make, right, just thinking about it, like, in what ways are we seeing Black women like killing the game today? And who are the Black women elders and ancestors who made that possible? So I want to start here with Liz based on some of our conversations um, and then go to Brooke and then Aaron. Just give us that historical, break it down how you did for me on the phone. Cause you had me like, girl. <laughs> girl, I literally was like, Liz, don't go there. Don't go to the 19th century, Liz. This is contemporary no, we ready. no, uh, uh, but we want that historical. That's I the question. We want to go there. <laughs> so, okay. Well, since you don't struck a nerve. <laughs> So I'll just keep it short and sweet, y'all. So essentially for me, like the lineage starts in the late 19th century. Um, for those of you who don't know, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American of the 19th century. At the same time, Sojourner Truth was also soliciting folks to take pictures of herself as her with the model. And on the, bo the bottom, she wrote, I sell my shadow in support of the substance or I sell my substance, yeah. One of those, basically, Sojourner had a, a caption, y'all, and she handed out these portraits to mobilize people against lynching, to mobilize people against like a lot of different causes and things like that. So when I say black women have literally been doing this since the beginning of time, since the invention of a, of a camera, you know, when literally you had to curate what's in between this screen, this lens, this frame, um, we have been doing it. And even around that time of Sojourner Truth kind of weaponizing the medium of photography, you also, there's like written records in, um, uh, when was it? Yeah, also around like the late 18th century of a black woman working in a, a, a photography business, um, hoping to print images and photographs. And so when I think, when I look at Easter on screen, I'm literally thinking about Sojourner Truth's face <laughs> like of her looking into the camera and sitting down and being like this is some bullshit Frederick Douglass think he's gonna be the only commentator on what the fuck is happening my sis literally sat down and said like this and she looked directly into the camera for a long time black folk could not look directly into the camera that was supposed to be obscene like you weren't supposed to do that how dare you look back at me but no she completely disrupted that and um that's why I pay so much homage to her and when I'm talking about Mia in the beginning of film and photography I'm really like Sojourner Truth like look it up you know but you know so when I think about selfies and I think about us gazing into the camera back at people or back into the public or basically asserting our gaze and our look that shit is so powerful. It's so freaking powerful because it's literally us sitting here looking at somebody being like, I see you. I see you and I want you to know I see you because not only am I gonna smile, but sometimes I'm not gonna smile and I'm gonna just have a straight face. But you can feel my emotion, you can feel my presence through the lens that literally makes the spectator or someone else look at the image and be like, damn, I don't know why, but I feel so moved by this person. And it's literally just their eyes looking back at me. And so, ew, sorry. 
<laughs> so, sometimes when we talk about film and like photography, we start in the 90s. But with Re, I was telling her to kind of like, like Aaron said, push the boundaries and like um, kind of add a little bit of gems and some sparkles um, from the 19th century, talking about when, you know, when photography was brand spanking new, who else was basically sitting in front of the camera or behind the camera? So, yeah. Thank you so much, Liz. That was a whole word. And Liz also inspired us to put oppositional gaze by Bell Hooks on the syllabus. So my students read that week one, and we talked about the lens and the gaze. So thank you for centering that relationship of seeing how we see, how we be seen. And what I asked my students when we go get into, how do I see myself, right? Can I see myself or do I only need to be seen and I can't see myself and I'm constantly needing everybody else to see me. So we're going to get into that when we get into social media. But that that idea about the lens and the gaze is so rich and so important. So thank you, Liz. And now I'm going to come to Brooke to take us to the more historical contemporary with all of your faves and the way that you broke it down for me around like the Black women who paved the way uh, for this contemporary moment that we have. So really, um, I'm still learning with my education, but what I was telling her was that Lizette actually, she posted a whole book list on her Instagram. And really I tapped into the book list and was reading the books. And so y'all need to go on Lizette's page and tap in. So one of the books that I was reading was Watching Wild Black. And that's when I was really able to learn like how um, pivotal um, Debbie Allen was to black TV and film, you know, like how, you know, also with like with me wanting to be a writer and me I, doing the research in Hollywood Reporter, only 4.8% of writers in the industry are Black, period, not even Black women, you know? So it's really just about like you, us being able to create our own stories, you know what I'm saying? And be able to tell them in an accurate way. And so A Different World was originally ran by a white woman and they were like, this is not hidden because it's, it's giving confusion, you know, like an HBCU, like what's even happening? And so Debbie Allen took it and made it what it was and really showed, you know, what how it was and, you know, really what's going on. So when Black women take the reins, you know, greatness happens. So really just like when I'm learning about my history, it's just like how these Black women are really true to this shit. And when you're looking at Debbie Allen or Spike Lee or, you know, I'm adding Spike Lee because Spike Lee's fire and Spike Lee, the, um, Liz is here, you know, with Spike Lee. But I'm saying like these people that are so young are really trailblazing shit for us. And that is what's like crazy. Like even when I had the pleasure of working with Issa Rae and it's just like really looking at this lady, like you really trailblazed some shit as in like with social media, which we're gonna talk, tap into the fact that she really burst down a door and I was taking over HBO and making black women millionaires all because she decided to put out awkward black girl and the networks had to come to her. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, that is the new history that we're creating. Like we are history right here. And all the all the panelists, all the people that are listening in, like we're all history. So I think that's what's dope. Thank you so much, Brooke. And Erin, anything else you wanna add just around how black women in this contemporary moment are making nuanced visions of ourselves possible? I think like Brooklyn said, black women are finding ways to do it themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like we've been doing it for corporations for a really long time without getting the credit. Like a lot of the big projects and movies and stuff that you see come out about black life, there's black women working on it. They're just not in the big roles. They're not getting the credit that they deserve. So now I think in the last 10 years, as we shift to social media, you see black women being able to do the things that they want to for themselves with smaller budgets. You know, it's nothing to take an iPhone out now and do a one minute video. You know, you can edit it on the phone. There's an app for that. <laughs> There's different things to put filters on it. You can put music over, you can do all of that without ever leaving, you know, the palm of your hand with the device. And so black women, I think are now like, okay, well, these people aren't gonna see my work. I'm just gonna tag them and I'm gonna have all my friends tag them. And then my shit's gonna go viral and they have no choice but to come see me and see what's up. And you see the same thing with um, 
different like clothing campaigns. There are lots of big brands that would never think about having black women as the face of their brands or something like that. And then you get pages like Black Girl Unboxing focused around like black women getting luxury items. And now they're getting sponsorships by Louis Vuitton and other places. You got places like Black Girls and Trader Joe's, you know, that come up and pop up, right? That's like, oh, Trader Joe's is now paying attention to what's happening happening and then you get sponsorships that happen so it's like um as black women take it and take that autonomy back take that agency back and are like we're just gonna do it ourselves fuck it other people come because they know i mean it's a beautiful thing and an unfortunate thing at the same time but they can capitalize off of it you know black women right now are very profitable we're we're incredibly profitable everybody wants an Issa ray on their team um they want to find who that next Issa is you know I just feel as though that next Issa is in the building in this virtual room right here. So shout out. Um, and I'm just, thank y'all so much. And, and what Liz was saying, I was just really thinking like Sojourner Truth, the way that you talked about her, it just felt like black girls been theory. Like Sojourner is the definition of black girls been theory. So the way that you broke that down, Liz, um, mm, it just hit. So thank y'all. And y'all have been hitting and touching on this social media, but I want us to dive into this next question. In what ways has social media made space for black women to be our full whole selves? And in what ways has it caused us harm? And I really want to have some real honest conversations about this y'all, because we'll talk about, okay, social media is toxic. I'm doing a social media cleanse, but then we back on, you know what I mean? There's this very, we got to have an honest conversation about the addictive nature, particularly I focus on Instagram in our class and we watch the social dilemma in our class to talk about the real life addictions of these screens, right? And yet they have caused us harm and have also provided us some healing. So how do we have a real honest conversation about the good and the bad of social media. And I shared a little of my personal journey with my students, um, but you know, in my other life, I, and before they had social media influencers, that's how I felt like I was a social media influencer and I had all my followers and I lived a very different life. I really did live for Instagram. My whole life was curated around what I could display on my social media page. So anywhere I went, anything I was doing, and I had to be taking a picture and looking fly and get the lighting right. And, you know, and I cared about how many looks, how many comments, how many views, likes, right? But that gets back into my point. I could not see myself. So I was using my Instagram to beg everybody to see me, to validate me, to affirm me, because I couldn't give that to myself. So now for me on my healing journey, it's meant stepping away. I'm going to tell y'all, God deleted the Instagram account that I had. It wasn't me. It was like really the system messed up and deleted the wrong account. I was trying to delete my secret page. And then God said, nope, <laughs> I'm deleting the other page. So just like that, all the followers left. And you know, people always say, oh, how, you, how would you act if you didn't have all your followers? God showed me. Come on, let's see. So that was right before I was putting my book out. I said, okay, God, well, how am I going to tell the world about my book? I ain't got to follow you. Yeah, but it was like God made it very clear to me. This is an invitation for you to see yourself. So that's been my personal journey. And I know that all of our personal journeys are different. I just had to share my testimony because it's been so healing for me. For me, my healing has required me to step away from that screen and step into my journal to create and curate and produce media that's just for me, that's sacred and holy and mine, and it's not for show. And I've loved Tony Jones. I'm going to play some more of her music at the end. She got two songs, y'all, Womaning in Silence and Being Real is the New Fake. And they both talk about this relationship that we've developed to social media, where it's like, I got to tell my whole story. I have to market my testimony. And that's what she'd be saying. Like, my, I ain't got to market my testimony. My life is not a commercial. Like, my story is not for show. I don't have to perform. Like, I don't have to show and tell. I'm learning how to woman in silence. Like, I don't have to woman in and perform my process. So 
I just want to know, what is y'all's relationship to social media? How has it helped you? Because I'm hearing a lot, right? That it's really helped you. It's helped Issa Rae. It's allowed us to see ourselves. And how has it also caused us harm? So whoever want to jump in. I'll, I'll talk. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ashley. Um, I'm going to start with the cons of social media. I feel like for me, I like like she just said, I more so cared about my image, you know, that I looked good. I got all the likes. People saw that I was pretty. People saw that I was doing well. And that was it. And, um, you know, while that may look good, I wasn't, I didn't feel good inside, you know, like it was just a first, it was just a facade. Like it wasn't real. I would go on Instagram and then, you know, I would compare myself to other people. People are, you know, talking to me and saying how much, you know, they appreciate I'm doing, they, um, they see that I'm doing this and I'm doing that, but it's just like, what am I doing? Like, it's fake. I'm fake. I don't want to be, I don't want to be fake anymore. You know, I didn't feel real. I didn't feel empowering. Like, how am I, how am I pouring into you? Like, what, what am I doing? I'm just posting pictures and looking cute. And I feel like that affected me because I started to compare myself to strangers on the internet. But the pro that I hope I'm not talking in circles, but the pro that I would get out of it is that I started to follow like mind people. You know, for example, like Issa Rae, I started to follow people that was true to their journey, that was being honest about them healing, that was being honest about their process, their growth. And those are the people that I started to follow instead of, you know, Kim Kardashian or whatever. Every, you know, no shade to them, but they always look good. We never know when the struggle is for them. Issa Rae, Lena Waithe, especially 20s. I really, um, you know, I really like, what's the word? I really related to that show because, you know, the main character, I forgot her name, but she, she's a, she's a writer. I was tired of telling people that I'm a writer and I wasn't actually writing anything. I was a pathological liar. That's what I was, you know? So I wanted to be really real in what I was doing. And I feel like following people, for example, like I follow Brooke and it's just like her, her, she's just so unapologetically her, like, you know, to her healing, to her growth. It's just like, wow, how can you really just be so transparent to the internet like this? Like, I wish I had that strength to do that, you know, because I just feel so, so bottled, you know, and I don't want to put it on the internet because I'm afraid people will see me as weak. But when I see her do it, it's just like, wow, like you're the strongest human being I ever seen. Like, why can't I do that? You know? So I just appreciate her, Easter Ray, Lena Wave, other Black people that I'm following. That's just so true to their journey and how transparent they could be with, you know, their their struggles, their process. Like it's helping me. Like I'm taking a step back from the internet now. Like I'm learning how to be still. That's it. Like not doing nothing, just listening to what God has to say to me. Like not trying to overwork myself, like just, just learning stillness. And I feel like it's still a journey, but I have seen the progress, you know, that I'm going through and yeah, that's, I, that's all I have to say. I don't want to talk in circles. Thank you so much. I appreciate your reflections. That was just so powerful and vulnerable. And thank you for reflecting back to me. Cause sometimes I'll be feeling like, well, dang, am I the only one who felt this way? So I hella, hella appreciate you. Thank you. And I want to come to our panelists. Like what has that journey and experience been for y'all? Whoever wants to jump in. I'll go. Um, first off, thank you, beautiful. Thank you. And I think one thing, um, I what going off what she's talking about, like me being so transparent, like that's one thing that my mom actually taught me was about like your testimony can change people's lives. And also me and my Aquarius nature just genuinely not giving a fuck. Like when I be on Instagram, I just be posting because I just like this is how I feel. Like I genuinely don't even be thinking about like how other people can take this. And then people will be on my DMs like, damn, you're so transparent. I'm like, oh damn, I forgot you was even here. Like I was posting this for me the whole time. I'm like, oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, okay, cool. Makes sense, got it. So I just think, you know, I'm thankful for that balance too, but I'm just saying that um, 
when it comes to the harmful and yet the beauty of it, I think we've talked a lot about the beauty of it, bursting down doors, literally created full careers, full-time creative careers. People are able to call themselves full-time creatives due to social media. I think that is power within itself. You know what I'm saying? I think that um, when it comes to people being able to see your art. And also like when I was in journalism, I was a journalism major and one of my um, professors, he wrote for the Black Panther Party and all of his um, art and his um, stories were like, they tried to kill him because he tried to um, publicize his stories. And so he's like, thank God for social media because y'all are able to tell true stories. You know, Twitter, we wouldn't know about half of these stories out here because of the internet and how we're able to just put the truth out, you know? So I'm also just thankful for just the open, the rise of the internet and how we're able to just tell the truth. So, and I mean, of course we need to work on the balance of actually doing the real research, you know? But I'm optimistic, you know, it's, you know, it's, we gotta master the gray like we're all trying to do. But the harmful thing of course is about like comparing yourself to other people. It's literally a highlight reel of what everybody got the fuck going on. So it's really just mastering, understanding that when you're looking at people's things, like this is not them all the time, you know, but also just like, I'm trying to think, cause I, this is something I'm exploring within myself. Like the, the true addiction of social media and how like when I'm putting it away and it's like, wow, this is tough. Like, why is this so tough? Like all I'm doing, it's not even really that great. Like when I get back on, I'm like, I didn't even really miss anything, you know? So I really just think it's just mastering, spending time with yourself and like being happy with yourself and your own highlight reel and your own, um, what that really telling your own stories and diving into your own world especially as a creative, you know what I'm saying? And of course, like following like-minded individuals that's really been helping me. I, one of my little quotes is use this shit to feed you, not defeat you. But I think it's just, I think it was really just a healing thing for me to step aside of it, to not be in other people's worlds, but to dive into mine. So that's it. <laughs> Um, for me, I feel like social media has done the same things that it does to all of us about making us feel insecure. You know, we're always looking at other people's photos and their videos, and that can be really hard to sit with. And maybe about, it's been a long time now. It was when I was an undergrad. I think my sophomore, junior year of undergrad, I like went through and cleared out all of my followers um, and all the people I was following and just did a huge cleanse of like, if I wouldn't talk to you in person, would I follow you? And that kind of, even to this day, like I have a lower amount of followers to people that I actually follow. It's not like my arrogance has my peace of mind. You know, it's like, I don't care about your content. You might like my content. That don't mean I have to like yours. That don't mean, <laughs> mean I have to, you know, engage with what you got going on. Or even people that I don't mind following, like they might have good uh, overall content, but their story is really annoying. Like I'll mute them. I'm like, I don't need to see this. And it's no harm, no foul because one, they can't see it. You know what I'm saying? So they'll never know. And then two, <laughs> it's like, at the end of the day, I want to use this app for all the things that it's good for. And in order for me to use it in that way, I have to protect myself and my peace as best as I can. And that looks like not following every single celebrity either. Like I'd hardly follow any celebrity unless they're like my all-time favorite. So like Solange, obviously. Beyonce up there only because I like the pictures of the babies for real, for real. Like it's Beyonce, but I'm really following her for the babies because everybody's going to repost Beyonce. So I tap in for the babies just for, for me, for me. <laughs> I want all 511 children pictures all the time. Um, and then uh, like a couple of like directors, but most of mostly I follow like homegirls, you know, other creatives in the Detroit area, other creatives around uh, the states that I've interacted with and different like black businesses, just because that's what I want to see when I'm engaging with 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 social so that I can be yeah Brooklyn was finna fire me up I'm like hold on now I love Beyonce that's not what I was saying <laughs> I'm like girl get the mop get the mop clean, it. <laughs> clean me up um no so um I try, I try to like really limit my like uh, uh, people that I can engage with so that I can be on there as much as I want and it doesn't deplete me, you know? And even if you go to my explore page on my Instagram, especially it's like all Sagittarius content, 
uh, black women women winning, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's like track stars, Olympians, uh, tennis players, it's like the, the content that I'm engaging with. And then I can get on there and be happy. And when sometimes I get on Twitter or Instagram and shit isn't well, then I just log off or I mute those people or I unfollow them. And I let it be that, you know, I try not to let it harm me as much as possible. But you, I think you have to really try to set yourself up for success in that way because it can be very toxic very quickly if you get the wrong algorithm. And the wrong algorithm can just be you stared at one picture you're too long on your explore page and now your whole shit is fucked so <laughs> be thoughtful in that too because the algorithm is always watching you um so if you feel like your algorithm or like you're seeing things that are making you feel triggered a lot it's probably because whether or not you know it, you're engaging a lot in it whether that's just staying on their page too long or watching all of their stories like start removing that quicker and seeing what happens to like your timeline. And um, if that helps you feel a little better as you're engaging with social media too. Thank you, Erin. And I also just want to ask you a follow-up question because you are our, well, I see, I don't know if you know, but you are our social media expert because of the way that you've curated your Instagram. So you talked about what you're seeing of other people, but I'm also wondering if you can talk more about how you curate your Instagram as a way to see yourself. Um, I think a lot about this book, Embodied Avatars by Yuri McMillan, and he talks about this, like all these different ways Black women are creating avatars of ourselves. And he talked about Nicki Minaj and different things. And I, my question from that book was, do we ever get to just be ourselves do we have to create an avatar of ourselves can we just be ourselves and I feel like your Instagram page is a beautiful exploration of you just being yourself and so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that well thank you <laughs> um I like to put things out that feel good to me um, I'm never going to put a piece of content out on my personal page that doesn't feel good when I see it. So if that means like, I'm looking at a picture of myself and I'm like, damn, I have to be a certain kind of way to feel the kind of energy that I did in this picture. I might not post that picture, even though it might be one of my faves, but if like I go on my Instagram page and now every time I see this picture of me with like, um, so for me, that would be like a full beat, you know, the most baddest club baddie, you know, Instagram influencer fit where the thighs and everything is all snatched um you know the hair is laid or like brightly colored for me or and I have really long nails like that's a whole aesthetic for me for me personally and so like if I look at a picture like that of myself and I and then I get a lot of likes on it I'm like damn well am I only beautiful if that is on there you know what I'm saying if that's the only representation of me so I try to like always diversify the content that I'm putting out so if I have like a carousel which is like a few different pictures that you my swipe through I'll make sure there's like a range of things in there like one thing might just be a picture of my legs or a picture of like me holding hands with somebody that I love or um a picture of me just like kind of me mugging and maybe I have on pajamas in a picture maybe I have on lingerie maybe I'm coming full bad bitch maybe I'm coming studious nerdy girl you know what I'm saying I try to give the variation of myself and never take myself serious enough to where I feel like I have to be one thing all of the time um and I think the youth girls like the young youtube girls really taught me i remember watching jackie aina i remember watching um and she's not lipstick and curls anymore but at a time she was lipstick and curls and i just remember seeing them on screen and just being like, like giggly and funny and being like i'm just doing what i want and oh shit the camera fell in oh hold on hold on <laughs> you know and this is stuff they could have edited out but they kept it in because it showed a little bit more of who they are and when i watch people on screen when i watch artists that i love perform what makes me come back to them is that they feel authentic every single time it never feels like a performance it never feels like a character and so when people engage with my content and I'm posting things and creating things I'm keeping that in mind who am I authentically and like if you ran up into me on the street at dinner at the bar would you be like oh this is the same Aaron I got on Instagram or this is one version of your person on Instagram or actually you say all these nice you say all these nice things on Instagram but you're actually a mean girl you know so I always try to be consistent with where I'm at and authentic and and represent who I am at the core in like the pictures and the videos that I'm putting out 
And that like, I think people, I mean, obviously people read that, read you inviting me here, you read that well. I've met people in real life off of socials who are like, oh my God, you're just like your social media. Like not just how you look, but how you, uh, like how you are, you know, the things that you care about, you can tell that you are authentically you all of the time. Um, so I, I try to point that out because people are watching that as Brooklyn said, and, and as um, Ash, Ashley, is that, is that how you say her name? Ashley. Ashley was talking about as she's witnessing Brooklyn, right? And how important that has been for her. It's like, I wanna make sure that I'm that from other people. And I can only be that for other people if I'm that person for myself um, first. Thank you so much, Boo Liz. We gonna come to you to close out the question. I'm sorry, okay, I don't wanna end on a negative note. I have a complicated relationship with social media at the moment. I, and I think it really came maybe even a little bit before the pandemic, I was just really questioning a lot of the things I was doing on Instagram. And the thing is, I, I'm very in touch with my emotions and feelings. And I often, or I used to share a lot about what was happening in my inner emotional world, because I always, like Ashley was saying, was feeling bottled up, but it felt nice to have a release. And then when I would get a like or a comment, like, oh my God, I feel the same way. I'm like, oh yes, I feel seen, I feel affirmed. But after the pandemic, I was like, I don't want to share a lot about what's going on anymore in my life. It feels like, it feels like some type, well, not only am I really big on surveillance, um, I get really cookie y'all with like algorithms and like other things that are at work behind the scenes, um, especially after watching The Social Dilemma. But like, I, um, I'm, um, even though, okay, I'm about to share, anyways, sometimes it feels weird um, when it comes to voyeurism where it's like I'm sharing a lot about my world, but there are people that are watching and aren't necessarily engaging, but just taking in that stuff. And so um, I've started to realize that a lot of the things that I do want to share that are a little bit more intimate, I kind of want to share that with like a small portion of my village. But I'm still, even in this moment, grappling on how I want to do that because I tried to create a Finsta where it was a more intimate space. But even in my Finsta, it felt like I was just putting things out there to just sit there without any type of like feedback or, you know, when I say feedback, I'm not saying like, oh, what did you think about this post? But like, actually, like, how do you, you know, how do you feel about that, Liz? Like you said that this was going on, but like, I, you know, I know this is an Instagram post, but outside of that, like, you know, and I think from that, maybe I was hoping that people will pick up the phone and call me. Um, but maybe that's just also me not fully communicating my needs to even my best friends and my village and my family. And so that's something that I'm working on. But lately, I've been in a space when it comes to social media, it's like me um, tending to my garden of like self care, but also like as an artist, I'm like, I can't do any of my work if I don't know what's going on with my immune system. Like, how are you breathing? How are you living? How are you like making sure that you are embodying a, 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 a practice of care? You know, and so I think the way that extends, that extends itself into social media is like, I just had an, ex anyways, ooh, look at me trying to get all intimate again. But anyways, like, I want to talk about women's health. When's the last time you had a pop smear? Like, I want to talk about cervix. I want to talk about food. I want to talk about nutrition. I want to talk about like, you know, I want to share more about theory. I want to share more about Black feminist theory and cultural studies. Like, I want to talk about poems. I want to, you know, so I kind of, now I'm using it more so from the um, lens of like sharing help, the information that could be helpful in terms of artists getting what they need first and then kind of um, tending to their artist practice and what that means through like literature and, and studies and things like that. And so, whereas before it was more so like I was using Instagram, like a journal, like a full blown out journal, like I'm in a space where I'm like, I love y'all, but this is a boundary that I'm setting for myself because I realize it's not, Instagram isn't what it used to be. You know, it's, it's a marketplace also. And like, I know that in this space where I'm trying to, where I'm a little bit more recluse, I'm like, now I have to you know, like you said, Re, like it's pushing me, motivating me more to kind of like be in touch with my community and reach out to folks that I really want to build with also because like I know that I'm going to a large portion of my life into my like early 30s and for the rest of my life will be chosen family um, for a number of reasons. But um, I really want to be more intentional about cultivating community outside of social media, but using my social media as a platform for, I guess, education and like 
just, you know, putting a word out there here or two and kind of sharing a little bit about me, but it's no longer a space where I feel completely comfortable and safe to, to like, you know, to be who I am fully, to be honest. And, um, but on the flip side, um, especially after coming out to my mom last June, well, this past June, right before Pride, um, I'm feeling a little bit more playful. Like I want to play in my career body. I want to, you know, experience those different things. I want to find new communities on Instagram. But like, so yeah, so I'm feeling a bit more playful, but I'm feeling a, feeling a little bit more recluse, but also I'm feeling a little bit more charged in my um, objective to like share really good information about things that people might not be thinking about on a regular regular. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Liz. I hella appreciate that. And I'm also just thinking about you as someone who's passionate about the archive and how social media also becomes an opportunity to archive communally and individually. And I also just wanted to say about the Finsta because I made me a Finsta and it has just been so great for me because I realized I really do love taking pictures. I have 46,000 pictures on my phone, y'all. Like I love taking selfies, pictures, being in my mirror, getting cute. Like I love feeling pretty and beautiful and taking pictures where I look a hot ass mess. Like I just enjoy the process of taking pictures of myself, of other people that I love. And I love my my Finsta because that's where I post everything and I love that because I used to feel like when I had my old Instagram like oh but I really do love this but I wasn't being honest about the other piece of it which is I'm seeking validation and now on my Finsta I had three people on there my boo my mama and my sister but then I ended up removing them so it ain't nobody on there and I love it because it's just me and me, all of me. It's my inner child, my teenage self, all of us be on there. And when I need to vent, I go on live. <laughs> I be talking to myself on my Finsta with just me and me. And it's been so healing for me. I got hella lives on there where I just be talking my shit and processing and all of my favorite pictures are on there. And so it's like my own archive because I do appreciate Instagram for that. And I love that it's like, I'm the only gaze I see. Like it's no other gaze, it's nobody else's, not even, I love my mama, I love my sister, I love my boo, but even them, I was like, did I get three likes? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I wanted to know. And if I only got two, I'm like, oh, my mama didn't like my picture. <laughs> And I was like, I need to not be relying on nobody but me to affirm me and affirm all that I come with. So that's just where I've been in my process. And I, and I appreciate you too, Liz, when you talk about boundaries, because my boundary with my real page is that like, and this is where I'm at right now, I might grow in a different place, but like, I don't want my personal life on, on there. I just don't because it's unhealthy for me because I've struggled with social media addiction. And it's been a, like, we could laugh about it, but it's been really, really unhealthy. Like it was deeply damaging to my mental health and well being. So for me, that boundary of, my Instagram is not a place where I'm fully nuanced on screen and that's okay. I just use it for work. I use it for black women healing. I use it for my book and my courses and all of that. But y'all not going to see my real life because I don't trust myself to let y'all see my real life in a healthy way. I'm not there yet in my healing. I'm just not, <laughs> that's just where I'm at with it. And it would be unhealthy for me to, um, violate that boundary that I've created because then it would invite all of that shit <laughs> that I'm healing from you know what I'm saying so I just appreciate hearing about y'all's process and just want to affirm like we all in our own places with it you know um so thank y'all thank y'all so much this conversation has just been so rich now I want to open up to our q a y'all know we be talkative I know we a little over time but I want to invite our audience to dive in we got some folks from my class shout out to Kita shout out to Luna I want to give a special special shout out to Luna because Luna just messaged me saying that she is looking for an internship 
a media internship. So I just also want to let the panelists know if y'all got any thoughts or ideas to support Luna. And Luna, if you want to ask a question about that, you can. But if anybody wants to ask anything or reflect anything back, uh, the floor is now open. Thank y'all for rocking with us and thank you for being here. Oh my goodness, that chat been blowing up. I ain't been keeping up. Hey, Jam, I see you. You see me? I see you, girl. <laughs> Luna, are you going to talk? Because I don't want to take it, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. let me um, just say something real quick. Thank you for asking. Um, sorry, y'all. I have my camera off. I was out like all night last night and I look rough right now. But <laughs> I really wanted to come to the panel and engage and hear all y'all's wisdom. Um, and thank you for the shout out. Uh, about the internship specifically, I am, I'm a senior in high school right now, and I want to do a media-based internship, and I really want to create something that revolves around Black women. I've been doing, like, organizing stuff my whole life, and I really wanted to cr transition to, like, the more creative side of that and, like, representing um, what I would do in organizing through art. And the medium that I usually would do is like visual arts, like I draw and I do digital art, but I really wanted tra to transition into something that I've been like wanting to do for a long time, but I never really got into it. So um, I'm trying to represent that through either like maybe a podcast or like a video cast or a YouTube series. I don't know exactly what direction I'm going in right now, but I really wanted to like access y'all because you guys are such an amazing source of knowledge and wisdom and I like just being in this space has offered me so much like knowledge like <laughs> I am trying to find the words right now but but it was like very enlightening and I I just love being in this space with y'all it's something that I've needed for a very long time and I'm so glad that this is offered Thank you so much, Luna. I'm so glad you got to make it. And if y'all have any thoughts about internships or opportunities for young Black girls who are creating media and looking to tap into those opportunities, let us know. And if not, it's all good. Um, if anyone has any possible thoughts or option for Luna's internship, y'all just go ahead and drop it in the chat uh, before our panelists, if y'all have anything to add. Um, well, what I would suggest is I know more film-based um, things, and it sounds like yours is broad right now. So film-wise, I have some Instagram pages I'll drop in the chat. But what I would strongly suggest, like I told you, I come from Google University. I come from not knowing anybody in the industry. I come from all of that. And of course, my sister has Justice for Black Girls. She has a lot of resources for Black girls in whatever avenue you um, want to succeed in. But when it comes to me, like just getting it out the mud, you need to DM people. Like one time my professor, he was just like, y'all don't understand the tool of social media and how everybody is accessible to you. You know, which can be a bad thing, which is what we're talking about in our healing, that everybody is accessible to you. But on the opposite end, everybody is accessible to you. So you need to DM these people, especially these people in these industries, like the top EPs, they be having 200 followers. They see your DMs, bitch. They may not respond because they like, this Instagram shit don't matter. I don't give a fuck. They, they be leaving me on red because they know that they are lit in real life. But they have 200 followers and they're going to see it. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you need to DM these people. And like my boss, she's the showrunner of a new show. People be DMing her. She be responding when she can. You know what I'm saying? So I just really just, that was like a life-changing thing for me when my professor told me to DM these people or email them if they're in their, their bios, you know, because, and then keep them updated on the things that you're doing. Like, hey, you know, I'm now working with so-and-so and this is something that I'm working on. You know what I'm saying? So I've gotten so many virtual mentors just by reaching out. So just reach out. I have a question and it's um, piggy banked off what you said, Brooklyn. I'm in a taboo when it comes to DMing people because it's just like, what exactly do I just ask? So I get straight to the point. Or do I, hey, like, I admire your work, such and such, like, hey, can we, like, I don't, I don't know how to, you know, really do that. You know, it's hard for me. Like, do I waste your, do I waste your time by bullshitting you? Or do I just ask you, like, listen, I just wrapped up this show. I'm trying to get on this one. You got a job for me? You know, that's, that's where I'm at with it. I don't know. So what I would suggest, and of course, like, Liz and Aaron can, you know, share their piece, but 
that's one thing about me. Like the only thing about this industry that I hate is it's who you know, not what you know. I've always been the type that I just want my work to speak for itself. I don't want to speak. I don't want to talk. I don't like none of it. But I had to get out of that shit because it's really who you know, not what you know. So basically when it comes to like DMing people, I'm the type of people, the person that likes you to get to the point. I don't need all the extra. But some people do. And you know, so it's just like, you gotta just like feel it out. Trust your own discernment. Also trust and realize and recognize your own worthiness. You know what I'm saying? They're not doing you a favor. You are worthy, you know what I'm saying? But it's also like, you're in a place that I wanna be in. So just like approaching it from that, like I'm amazing, you know, but like, so basically just like, hey, I really admire this specific work. Also do your research first, you know what I'm saying? Like if I'm reaching out to Easton Ray, like Insecure is what actually inspired me to even move out to LA and be a writer, you know, and then follow up with your question. You know what I'm saying? So just like make sure that you just hit all, all the things. So introduce yourself, um, flatter them briefly because they don't want to read a whole paragraph about themselves. Some people do, but not somebody that you would want to work with. And then say what you need. That's what I would suggest. Thank you, Brooke. Liz or Erin, do y'all have anything to add around Luna's question about an internship or like DM reaching out? Oh, Luna, where are you located? Um, right now I live in West Oakland, but I've lived like all over Oakland my whole life. Oh, okay. 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 Well, I was going to say if you were in New York, like, um, there are some like artist collectives in the area maybe like you can connect with them. I would definitely say, cause Oakland is rich. Oakland is rich with artists. I haven't been and I would love to go, um, and kind of like root there for a couple months, but like definitely look for some artist collectives on Instagram and connect with folks, um, who are in the community and DM them and see if you can link up in person. Um, that's also one way to do it. I would say connect with large institutions, maybe like public libraries or colleges in your area and just cold email them, cold email their human resources. Um, and their career planning and development um, um, what, what places um, because you never know who they could like also connect with connect you with. I would say for the personal platform that you're trying to create, maybe you can create an Instagram and start exploring and using it as a canvas, but solely dedicated to the kind of art that you want to do. So if it's podcasts, maybe you can start compiling a list of podcasts that you came across and you want like want to learn about. Um, so yeah, that's another way to do it. And then also with my little passion project, even though you're in Oakland, like if there's if there's something that you would want to do, I can host it on my platform of the Live and Doula project because it's literally for women, black women and girls, like artists who want to get into creative writing, film, and photography. And your passions fall into a spectrum of any of those categories. And so if there's, you know, maybe we can get together, draw up a little plan. Maybe you can host like um, a series once a month, you know, do a podcast episode. Maybe you can film your stuff and then we can host on there. Um, maybe we can do a live. Maybe you want to like find folks in Oakland that you might want to interview and maybe you can do a live and put it on the, on my Instagram page. Like use, use my platform to kind of explore your, your art and, you know, different themes and things like that. So that's also another, um, another avenue. I'll drop the website um, in the chat um hey, it's growing the website and so is the community so please don't judge <laughs> it's, it's a working stage it's beautiful <laughs> it's beautiful thank you so much Liz and I'm so sad y'all because we had the black lesbian archives in the building and she just had to log off but the black lesbian archive is based in the Bay Area Luna so I think that also might be um, a great opportunity and she was just here so you could slide in them DMs and be like hey I was also at that event I'm looking for an internship or just to connect, right? Because I know there's this internship, but what I'm hearing is it could be a lot of different things. Your internship could be, look, I'm dreaming up for you. It could be Live and Doula Project with Justice for Black Girls with the Black Lesbian Archive and you bridging all three of these different platforms and all of these platforms are supporting you in whatever your dream project is. So it's Black women here in the building who are excited to make some things happen for you. And I just want to shout out Bree Baker, who is Brooklyn Baker's sister, who runs Justice for Black Girls, which is also an amazing initiative um, that produces a lot of powerful media empowering and um, celebrating Black girlhood. So Erin, did you want to add anything? Um, just a little nugget because 
Liz and Brooklyn definitely said what needed to be said. Um, I would say that if you don't have, if, if for some reason um, you're, you find an internship even that you love and it's not quite getting you to where you want to be or it's not giving you the skills, like just do what it is that you want to do with what you have. So I am really into film now, probably in terms of making it myself, probably only because of Instagram reels. Like when reels dropped, I was like, oh, I can chop up a video. Oh, I can change the angles. Oh, I can do different, all these different things and make people see what I wanted to see and what I wanted to feel. And I can soundtrack that with music. Hmm, this is kind of cool, right? And I had already been critiquing like other films that I've seen, but never thought I could do it myself, right? So it's like something so that I use and interact with all of the time. Now I have at the tip of my fingers to start playing and doing while I wait in the meantime or while I'm doing something else. Like, let me just play with some other shit and do a 30 second reel and see what happens. Um, and you can even do that with interviews. So like, uh, I don't remember exactly which platform it is. It might be like W or Vogue or maybe neither one of those magazines, but it's where they come into someone's house and they ask a hundred rapid fire questions, right? You can do that with IG reels. You just record somebody and then chop, 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 right? You don't need a huge camera crew. You don't need a, a huge big name for it to happen. You can interview the person in the community that you're already interested in interviewing. And now you have three reels in a row. You pitch it to the newspaper, like, look, I'm doing these interviews. I would love to do this series for your, for your, for your YouTube. What's up with that? Like I've already been doing it. Um, so there's ways to get your way in there, um, however you'd like. Thank you so much, Erin and all of y'all. Um, Luna, I hope this was helpful. And it sounds like you have some folks to tap in with, Bree, Liz, and the Black Lesbian Archive. So I'll be happy to support you in connecting with them folks as well. And we are just sending all the ancestral prayers uh, for your dream of this internship to come to fruition. And I also saw Jam um, wanted to ask a question. So we will come to Jam next. Hi, y'all. Um, so first of all, y'all were everything, everything, everything. I didn't expect anything less though. Um, I feel like I just resonated like with all of you all on different levels, just like, you know, especially, well, really everybody, but I'm gonna start with Aaron, like, I feel like, you know, this whole, I'm in a PhD program right now and every day I'm like, I feel like I'm holding on to it for security, but in actuality, there's this creative side of me that really wants to blossom, right? Um, but feeling like nervous about, okay, what does that look like for you? How are you gonna transition into this? So I really appreciate you for sharing that story. And my question is gonna come out of that story. Um, <clears throat> but even just thinking about like this whole like social media break, right? Like. I've been trying to find that balance between like being present on social media, but also taking care of myself. So right now I'm not on Instagram, right? So I reached out to Brie like, yo, when's the first Black Women Healing, right? Because I'm not on social media, but I know you're going to have it, right? I hope so. Um, but also feeling like, again, wanting to be in that space to be connected with people, but also recognize like I need to take a step back and really understand who I am. And so I do have like a, what is it, a Snapchat where I got like five followers or something like that. So I go on there and I was cracking up at Reed because I really go on there and just be telling, just telling stories. I don't care about the five people who are watching. I'm just on there posting stories about myself and just posting pictures and stuff because it, it takes away the pressure of feeling like, okay, I need, you know, the likes, I need the looks, I need the, all of that. And I'm just jam, like I'm just jam in that space. And so I love that. Um, but I think for me, um, where I, the question really comes in for me is like, how are y'all managing like, and be as transparent to whatever degree you want to be, how are y'all managing like taking care of yourselves like financially, emotionally, and mentally? Because I want to do this, right? Like I want to step into it. I want to make time for it, right? But I'm in this outdoor program that's giving me security. I love, I'm also intellectual, right? Like I love being in this space. I love, you know, learning the things that I'm learning, but I do to a degree, like in my soul and spirit, feel like this ain't, this ain't where I'm supposed to be. But it's hard to accept that um and not know what's next so that's my question yeah that was a lot <laughs> thank you oh, sis. <laughs> yeah um I would say where are you where where are you in school I'm at UGA right now okay yeah. okay okay mm -hmm. Um, I would say is it like, see if you, there's a leave of absence policy, like if you're allowed to take a semester off or, 
Um, sometimes I know at least in my university, they're like, you have one leave of absence and free of cost. We're not asking no questions. You ain't got to do no special paperwork. Like you're not getting paid, but you got the semester, you know? So um, <laughs> that's kind of what I'm doing this semester just to kind of figure out, you know, what it is that I want to do. And in truth, I'm not, I know I'm not going back. I just um, am not sure exactly what, you know, will continue to transpire for me over the next few months. You know, I have a few different bags that I'm in and who knows what will happen, what's going to pop. Things will pop though. Just what will it be? <laughs> um, so I would say like, trust your, trust whatever your gut is telling you to do around that. I am, I've been in a master's program before this, that was two years and then came to my PhD. And after year two, halfway through year two, I'm like, I hate this. I hate going to class. I hate, and even though it's virtual, like I hate going to class. I hate talking to these niggas because they don't talk about the people that I want to, that I want to talk about. They don't talk about them in a way that makes sense to me. Even in my black, like, um, my black critical studies classes. It was like, they we're taking this very elitist classist view, even if we're not trying to be, or, you know, everything is, it's either ghetto or it's editorial. And it's like, what about this everyday shit? You know what I'm saying? That, that deserves to be studied and understood. And so it got to a place for me where I'm like, I'm just tired of this. And I'm tired of the way I have to talk about this and perform this and theorize about this when I could be reading and theorizing at home home like my favorite scholars black feminist scholars were theorizing and writing from their homes with their lovers off their terrace drinking tea and shit so I'm like I don't need to be in the classroom doing this <laughs> with y'all like I don't have to do this with y'all so um that's kind of how I got to this place but I'm also a Sagittarius which means whenever I'm ready to go I'm ready to go and that's it we're done we're out uh so I think it's like a little bit of trusting your gut and then knowing what you're going to be comfortable with like like, are you the kind of person that needs six months of security, financial security before you'll take a leap? Or are you the kind of person like me who is like, we just gonna make a way, we gonna hustle. I'm, I live in the hustle city of the world. Like I'm gonna get it, get it out the mud, okay? <laughs> However I need to get it. And all my this bills are paid true, Detroit. every month. You know what I'm saying? They're, all my bills are paid every month. And every month I'm like, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but, it, but it's happening. So mm -hmm. it just depends on what you're comfortable with and, and willing, willing to do to get to that point. And so for some people it's like, okay, I'm okay with being a PhD student and becoming a professor and doing other things on the side. Like I think Ree is a beautiful example of somebody who's like, I love teaching and I wanna be a professor and I want this PhD to help people who look like me because I wanna talk about it in these ways, you know? And she still is writing a book and doing other creative, amazing things and holding healing spaces. So you can do it that way, or you can do it in, in another way where maybe you're not as creative as a professor, or you can just say, Fuck all that shit, you know? And I'm sure there's more plethora of ways to do it in between, but you got to figure that out and like really think on what it is that brings you happiness. And is it like burnout right now as a PhD student? Um, Cause that happens. <laughs> and are you really exhausted with just your program? And you want to leave it overall or, or is it like, okay, no, there's something that I want to do instead. And I know without a doubt, I'm ready to do that. Right. I think I've kind of went back and forth between the two. Like I thought like, okay, Jam, you can continue this journey, um, get your doctoral degree, be a professor because you still enjoy being an intellectual. You still enjoy being in community with people and like learning um, and do creative stuff on the side. It's just, I don't know, something in my spirit. Like you, it was something you said. You were just like, yeah, I'm, I'm in this classroom. No, this is what you said. I'm about to write this shit that nobody's going to read. That's, that's the thing for me. That's it for me. Like, I'm like, okay, how, how can I transfer this into a medium where people are receiving it in the way that I need them to receive it instead of talking to these white women, right? About what I'm trying to, you know what I mean? Like, and so I, so part of me does, you know, I think I can, you know, go the route where I, you know, continue to be a professor and find ways to be creative on the side. Um, but I don't know. I just, I'd be going back and forth. I'm a Pisces, I'm a water sign. So to the degree, I'm like, I need security. Uh, you know, I need security, but it's like, like, I want to be a director. This, this is in my spirit. I'm like, I feel like I can direct. I can be a creative director. That's what I think. Um, but I'd be like, but that security though, there's something about that, that just makes me feel like I, I'm in my own way. I'm gonna be honest. Um, but yes, I want to hear from the rest of y'all too, about just like, how do you all manage it financially? That's the thing for me, like financially. And just, cause I know, you know, might be some months that you know things a little tough a little tight 
Mm-hmm. I can just jump in too, love. And Aaron, I appreciate you. So I am a PhD student. I get them checks. And for me, I'm the same way. Like I need that security. And Aaron has hella inspired me and made me question my whole life and what I want to do. But I'm just constantly pushing the bounds of academia and I'm going where my spirit leads me. So right now my work is shifting towards religious studies. And I'm thinking about ancestral and spiritual diasporic practices of healing through that lens. And my spirit is leading me there. So I'm realizing what I'm pushing up because I was trying to force myself to fit into boxes of disciplines that weren't for me. So I'm going into the creative disciplines. I'm going into the disciplines that are unapologetically talking about spirit. So I don't have to convince people why spirit matters. I can just like, there is a place for you, I believe. And I feel like by trying to force myself into the rigid social sciences, of course, I'm constantly having to prove myself because there I have to make so much room for myself there in ways that I st- there's always going to be something about me where I got to make room, but it's less effort to make room for my creative praxis in humanities disciplines than me trying to force social sciences, you know what I mean? And, and and that's the thing. I'm so interdisciplinary. I can go a lot of different places, right? So I'll still go to the social sciences stuff, but I'm going to let them know, look, I do humanities. I do work on the spirit and I'm unapologetic about that. And I don't need to prove why this matters to y'all because there's other people who are centering spirit, centering creativity, centering artistry, in the ways that they're thinking and theorizing. So I would just encourage you to think about like where you can find intellectual homes within academia. But, and also if you wanna leave girl, that's an option too. But I'm also like you with needing the security. And so for me, I'm finding ways to bridge and merge all of my passions and figuring out what are the disciplines, where are the places, where are the professors and the scholars. And I'm going to tell you too that I'm I'm doing postdocs instead of trying to jump right into being a professor. I want a postdoc so I can have two or three years to get paid <laughs> and do my research, which is really doing my healing and my creative work. And I can tell y'all, I give them a little paragraph. This work is an autoethnographic account. I write unapologetically in vernacular English in order to center the ways in which Black women interact on an everyday roundaway basis, period. Then the whole essay is your homegirl who braiding your hair, she is introducing you to ancestral slippages. Okay, because my the way I write is very vernacular, but I give them a little paragraph, right? I let them know I'm intentional about this writing praxis as a decolonial mode of refusal. Sprinkle their little words in there, then you do your shit. So I'm very happy to talk to you more about this, this. Um, but I just from my standpoint, I do think it's possible. But I love me and Aaron are like on two different sides of it, but both doing our work unapologetically. So you got options. Um, I'm gonna come to Liz and Brooke too, um, if y'all wanna add anything. Mine will be brief. Y'all are in y'all, you know, I like to, the knowledge that is, y'all on, we're on two different sides of the world. You feel me? I. What I would suggest as a creative, um, one thing I was nervous about with being a creative is because I am a very logistical grounded person when it comes to money. Don't play when it comes to that shit. So I talked to God like, are you sure? Are we really sure that this is the creative path for me? Because I like to know when the money is coming. Um, so one thing that I had to really do, which is of course, um, have your plan for the money and save for the money. Cause one thing with me, I wasn't comfortable moving to LA unless I had a certain amount or unless I had a job, you know? So setting those boundaries for yourself, but also trusting your worthiness, trusting your God given talent, trusting your knowingness. And then the money will come. You know what I'm saying? Like God is not going to allow you to fail, especially if this is something that is something that is birthed inside of you. You know what I'm saying? You feel like you're a creative director because you are a creative director. You know, like this is something that was in your path even before you even knew you know, your name, you know what I'm saying? You chose to be a creative director, you know? So it's like, you have to remind yourself of those things in the hard times. And also the money will come, like picking those avenues of your talents, you know what I'm saying? Like 
I'm gonna create a director over here. So I'm gonna do that over here. And then I'm gonna do tutor kids over here. You feel me? It is a part of the hustle and the bustle, but it's just like with you being such an intellectual and a PhD, like people just trust you off strength of your credentials. You feel me? I don't even know what you do, but I'm like, oh, this bitch is smart. So like, cool. Like she can join my team because she clearly knows what the fuck, you know? And even if you don't know the fuck, they're not gonna know. You know more than me, you know, you know more than, you know? So it's really just like, really, honestly, what I would suggest is from a spirit uh, that's the only way I can truly give you advice is from a spirit is just trusting that the money will come because the money will come. You know, when you're walking in your purpose, the money will come. Yes, Aaron, Brooklyn and Reese said it so beautifully <laughs> because I know I was looking to a PhD program too, but I just wasn't ready. After my master's, I just could not jump back into um, academia just yet. But I realized I was still yearning to kind of like be intimate with my research and my passions, hence the Lab and Doula project, like me finding another space where I can still tend to that garden because it was so important to me, especially like, you know, the, in the intellectual traditions of Black women artists. Like th those are things I still wanted to explore. However, working in the film industry, there's barely any security. Like the other week, I I had picked up a new job and I was like a week away from um, being eligible for their health insurance. And then they like dropped me like a hot potato. And so that was really, you know, like it was crazy. And then me turning 26, being off my parents' insurance, like that, that was just a whole nother thing. But being in this industry is, is, is intense. Like being in the, the arts industry because security doesn't always come when you need it. And so now I'm in a place where I'm like, I have a job, holler. Shout out to the, my network and my village because you're going to have to constantly lean on your village for those extra opportunities and different segues into another opportunity that may bring that money. Um, but now I'm also at a place where I'm like, okay, well, if I love doing X, Y, Z, you know, my little passion project, like what are ways that I can find, you know, what are ways that I can make money through it? You know, whether it's maybe having a workshop or a movie night, a screening in Brooklyn, you know, having like a, a, a networking event for other artists and collectors, but providing the vibes, hosting writing workshops. Like Brooke came to one of my writing workshops last year in January, right before the pandemic hit. I didn't charge for that because I'm like, I don't need to, you know, I'm not at that place where I want to do that just yet. But I'm like, in some way, shape or form down the line, I'm going to have to find a way to kind of build that that sense of security, you know, through monetary funds so that I can continue doing that I want to do um, when I have to do what I have to do also, you know? So that's, an, that's another thing for me. It's hard. Okay, I wanna ask just a quick clarifying question. So like when you are in these roles, right? Like, do you, for instance, like, um, I think you said you're the show run, assistant showrunner for the Easter Project coming up, right? Are you getting- That's, that's Brooklyn. <laughs> No, 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 not you. I'm talking about Brooklyn. I'm looking at Brooklyn. You can't, you can't see it on, but I'm looking at her. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so I guess my question is, once you get on that project, right, like, does the money start coming in immediately or is it like at the end of the project? You know what I mean? Like, those are the questions that I have that I feel like I don't have transparency on, like. Yeah, so those are just, so, okay, cool. So that's one thing I because before this job, I had a regular job and I knew once God was taking me to this realm, it was like, it's you hopping, your job hopping. So mm -hmm. the good thing is that, so for example, I get paid every week. So now that I'm here, so I don't have to wait till the end. That's some bullshit. But once this show is over, it's done for. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I have to make sure like, that's why my boss, she has already has another show. So I'm just like, can I just tag along with you? So that's why it's like, who you know, not what you know, because the thing is, everybody knows about that. So everyone's working. So like all the EPs and everything, they're already working on their next show, already planning their next assistance, already their writer's assistance. One time I was in the writing room and they were like, yeah, so we're just so happy to be looking for a writer for Grownish. So y'all know, like once you're in the room, everybody knows that this is how the industry works. So er their jobs are rolling in. You just got to get in, you know what I'm saying? And stay on the hustle and just like make relationships with people. But like once you get in and you are the person that you are, people are going to keep passing the jobs to you and you do get paid weekly or bi-weekly. It's, you don't have to wait for the end. Projects like that or when you're doing like photo shoots, short films, but when you're working in like TV production, you get paid weekly. Okay. What is um, net 90s? What, is, what do you mean by that? Net 90s is how you get paid sometimes um, that are like creative direction projects, photography projects, um, sometimes short campaign rollouts where it'll take 90 days from when the project is done till you get paid. 
Um, so they also have net 60s and net 30s. Hopefully most times, like if you're working with a corporation, especially if it's like a local branch of a corporation. So like in Detroit, they have Foot Locker Detroit. They usually do net 30s out of their like corporation. So like once you re they receive the project from you, then you get paid 30 days after that. Um, but that's something to consider, right? And that's not something I knew right away until I got my first project. And I'm like, hold up. It's been uh, three weeks since I got paid from y'all. Hold up, what's going on? And they're like, yeah, you got another, you got another four weeks. It's, it's a net 60. So um, those are things. And you can also ask those things up front. It's not like they surprise you. They just might not tell you. You just don't know to ask. It might just be so accustomed to what they are used to in their industry. that They don't even think to describe it to you. And so like when it comes to payment, I ask a lot of questions. When am I supposed to get paid? What do you need from me? How much is this tax? You know what I'm saying? Should I put this in as tax deductible? What is this? You know, so yeah. Thank y'all so much. And thank you, Jam. Thank y'all for y'all transparency. Thank you, Jam. Um, I just want to name and acknowledge. I appreciate y'all so much because I know we are so over time. But thank y'all for just being willing to be here and share so much of your brilliance and your knowledge with my students and with our community. This was just so rich on so many levels y'all thank you i want to just play the song i was telling y'all about because when we were talking about um social media and stuff i made a playlist for my class so this song is on our class playlist and as we close out if y'all can just give some love in the chat let folks know how much you appreciate them let's celebrate Aaron and Liz and Brooke and just appreciate them and let them know what resonated with you as we close out and y'all and I'm gonna drop that this, is trying to be so this real Tony Jones other. She I be surrender preaching. so I can get more real with, myself. real with myself. I no longer use social media as my diary. Tell my story. Market my testimony. Reel others in to follow my steps. Pitch the sale or promo. My story is not a commercial, not an advertisement. I went to hell and heaven for this story. My story ain't cheap. I share only the necessary when necessary. I find ways to practice mindfulness on social media. I'm stellar at this flaw of perfection. Spirit take me beyond real all seeing i don't leave me to me show me how much more real i can get with myself show me where i'm lying to myself i am the only one on the planet i can't lie to authenticity is an inside job not a brand to market myself as relatable i won't listen to the tongues of charmers who have sweet flattery another thing i wanted to mention y'all if y'all are interested in seeing the syllabus for my class that has different readings and texts um i will be uploading it on blackwomenhealing.com courses so i'll also drop that in the chat for y'all as well if you haven't already just go ahead and throw in the chat some love and affirmation for our panelists y'all this has been so beautiful. I'm going to play one more. This is The Womaning in Silence by Tony Jones. Share. As y'all continue post. to celebrate. I want to show and tell what pain said to me. Chance. Aspiration said to me. High integrity and my evolution whispered me and told me that. I have the right to remain silent, hide and seek. I calm down the doing of the most to be enough. I receive comments from above to comment below. I release the need to know, to be certain. I release the temptation to heal what is outside of me, to distract me to from To heal the what is outside of me. So y'all see why I'm passionate about Tony Jones. She has supported me so much in my healing from social media addiction. But thank you. Thank y'all so much for real. This has just really um, warmed my spirit. And just, I feel like y'all have been hugging me for these past few hours. So thank you. I appreciate y'all and appreciate everyone who has been here. I'm so excited to upload this to our class and share it with my students. This will also be up it on YouTube for folks who didn't get to. Um, and with that, I will say thank y'all. If y'all can do a little wave, I'm gonna make this the, um, you know how you gotta pick the picture for the uh, YouTube? I wanna make this the picture for the YouTube. So thank y'all. Thank y'all for being here. So much love. I'm gonna stop the recording.